Hey y'all. Happy Friday. Um, welcome back to Chef Live. I am Jody Wolfborn, a senior developer advocate at Chef Software. Um, and today I am super lucky to get to have a conversation with two of um two of many amazing engineers from our professional services team here at Chef. Um, and what that lingo basically means is um, you guys all get to benefit or you all get to benefit from their expertise and experience implementing Chef um, within different uh, organizations and um, community members and customers. So, um, oh, uh, and I see Alan is in the chat. Hey, Alan, nice to see you. That's uh, Zoltar, Alan Lubin from our Solutions Architect team, um, who's also super knowledgeable and I've uh, had a ton of time, ton of fun uh, working with him on a road trip a few months ago. Well, not a few, several months ago, um, <laughs> long before uh, road tripping was no longer a, a thing. So, um, anywho, uh, with, yeah, exactly. Last year, a year ago, time has flown so much and also nothing has happened. Um, so, uh, without kind of any further ado, I want to introduce you to my two guests today. Um, as I mentioned, they're both on the ProServe team here at Chef. Um, we'll start out with Subro Carr. And uh, Subro, if you could tell us a little bit about your, your um, history uh, with Chef, maybe, and what you're working on, uh, not necessarily specifically uh, what you're working on, but um, some of the cool projects that you've done um, with Chef stuff. Sure. So I work for um, professional Chef Professional Services. I have been working for Chef since uh, uh, two years, seven months, two year, yeah, uh, two years and some change. And I have worked with Chef as a technology for about four years and some change, uh, almost five probably. So I work with customers. My primary responsibility is to uh, turn around customers who are traditional, uh, who, who don't quite follow the well-accepted DevOps principles in the market these days. Um, I have had people who are, <clears throat> who are completely new to DevOps. They, will, they have no idea wh what exactly is DevOps. Okay, they think DevOps is a product. They think DevOps is a light switch that you can turn on and become DevOps friendly. Uh, a lot of my time is spent uh, explaining to them what DevOps is and what DevOps is not. A lot of times uh, I would actually uh, implement something and administer it for them for a brief while and then reverse shadow them till the time they are at least enough to fly and not crash. And uh, yeah, that's what I do. That's awesome. I love the um, sort of mentoring aspect of that where um, you don't just go in and set up a system and then like smoke bomb, you're out. <laughs> uh, bye, have fun. Uh, you, you allow them to learn by um, implementing it with you. That's cool. Yes. Cool. Actually, most of the um, times I try to actually let them do the work and uh, be very hands off keyboard. Sometimes I do have to get on the keyboard when we are in a time crunch or I'm just I just need uh, an example to show. That is the only time I prefer to touch the keyboard. But yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Cool. Um, well, let's hear from Jeff Brumager, also from the ProServe team. Jeff, can you kind of talk us through the same thing, like your history at Chef and some of the um, some of the overarching things that you've done? Oh, and I love uh, in chat, Alan said, um, like we as a company really do kind of sell the DevOps, uh, um, not just like implementing our solutions, but also helping people understand the processes and the ideas that will help them um, like improve their organization, not just the automation of whatever they're trying to automate. Um, anyway, sorry, Jeff, <laughs> to interrupt you. So, um, uh, yeah, will you uh, give us an introduction to yourself? Um, and then, oh, I forgot, uh, maybe Subro after you can answer this too, but um, Jeff, tell us maybe one of your hobbies outside of Chef as well. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've been a Chef user for roughly seven years as a oh. customer six. 
Um, I brought Chef into every job I've worked at. In that time, I worked at AIG Global for four years. I implemented Chef the first time there. I was trained by Stephen Lauk, actually, um, oh, when, he, awesome. when he was pro-serve. Um, I've taken it to every bank and medical company I've ever worked for, bringing DevOps in as a culture, being the lone, the lone guy saying, hey, we're doing this the hard way. <laughs> so <laughs> I, have, I have fought that fight from the hardening side, the infrastructure side, the XAAS side of everything. Um, I've been at Chef for a year and three months now. April Fool's Day was my starting date, actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and since I've been here, I've, I've had the luck to be able to do a lot of cool, more bleeding edge stuff with our customers, kind of getting in there and going, Hey, uh, let's try this thing, <laughs> which is, which is a lot of fun. And, yeah. um, I get to use every end of our product daily to kind of get in there and, and show our, I, I spent a lot of time proving the negative, right? Yeah. We get in there and they're resistant to change and we want to train them, but they don't understand why we want to train them. And we got to, we just got to go, okay, cool. I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. We're going to come together. We're going to see how this works. We'll go from there. I found this on the web. My Google, my <laughs> Google picked up. Uh, as far as hobbies go, I have a huge list. I do collodion photography. I play guitar. I build cards and motorcycles. Whoa. What was the first one? Uh, Collodion photography, Civil War style, tin type, type, using oh, black steel okay. and, and blackened glass to do silver nitrate photography using gun cotton and ether. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> that is it's more it's words pretty... <laughs> than I totally understand, I'll be honest. Yeah, I have a couple hundred plus year old cameras. Oh, cool. Um, I have, I've not been like fascinated with antique cameras but my dad has always been um in telecom since i was a kid and so i've always been fascinated with like antique telephones the ones with like the little um thing you pick up and hold up to your ear and like speak into the microphone and stuff so that's yeah, that's yeah, you really gotta be cool. careful with those things you can electrocute somebody with them oh really i did not know that yeah <laughs> Cool. <laughs> oh, hey, Echo Hack, how's it going? Um, <clears throat> all right, Subro, what a, what uh, um, what hobbies do you have? <laughs> oh man, what hobbies do I have? I'm a photographer as well, completely analog. I shoot uh, medium format and large format. I don't shoot tin types. I shot that when I was in grad school, but uh, because there was a course for alternative processes, it never Ooh. caught on to me. Um, I am a pilot. I am both a fixed wing and a rotary wing pilot. I Whoa. participate in a lot of search and rescue missions. Um, I fly with the US Air Force uh, Auxiliary. I am a photographer. I'm a motorcyclist. I hunt. I competition shoot. And I piss Jeff off. <laughs> That's not true. So <laughs> Before, <laughs> before we um, went live, Subro and Jeff were talking about um, their differences and how uh, Subro is from Washington, Jeff is from Texas, and maybe some of the things you can assume from that. Um, but basically what you both just said is like, you're, <laughs> you're very similar people, actually. Um, that's, that's pretty funny. So um, maybe we should dive right in. Uh, <laughs> we are, oh, yes. Alan says you're holding the S under your shirt. Superman. I like it. Um, uh, sorry. So maybe we should dive right into some of the places where you do have um, differing opinions and get into a conversation about um, advice that you would give to someone who is um, like we've we've uh, they've just got licensed to um, use Chef, but they've never actually um, automated anything beyond maybe like some PowerShell or Bash scripting. Um, what what can uh, like 
what advice can you give um, both of you? And maybe uh, we'll start with Jeff this time. What advice would you give to someone who's like brand new and just about ready to like start implementing Chef in their organization? Um, from a training aspect, there's, I, I will normally guide people towards our Learn Chef. It's, it really is. I mean, I taught myself chef end to end on that website in a month and a half wow. six years ago. It's, it's not the hardest thing. If they're, if they're worried about not being able to do much, but shell scripting or PowerShell chef pretty much takes that out of the equation. Um, if you get the right tools like VS code or chef plugin, it writes it itself. Um, from a implementation aspect, I may let's jump into the deep end of the pool and, and make it as easy as possible, even though it doesn't sound as easy to some people. Um, <laughs> I, I'm an effortless advocate, 100%. I don't want you to have to deal with extra infrastructure. I want you to come in and have two servers, all your code in one place, easily changeable without having to go through a multiple pipeline system. So that's usually what I advocate for. Um, that's when you say, oh, um, and I just got some feedback from Alan that the sound is a little bit muted. Um, but when you say effortless, um, I mean, obviously you mean easy and wonderful, um, but I think you're also referring to the, the effortless pattern within Chef, right? Is that correct? Correct. And can you talk a little bit about what that pattern um like what it entails and why you think it's um, easy to like just get like boots on the ground really quickly up and running. So it's so much easier to go in and build a single stream pipeline where all you're worried about is a code repository and a place to deploy your applications to. So Essentially with the effortless pattern, you are no longer treating the chef client as a multi-server structure. You're treating the chef client as its own piece of software and delivering it as an application with all of its dependencies in one shot. Right. You don't have to worry about grabbing another server to get your external code books. You don't have to worry about managing policy group and policy file the same way. Everything is traceable through your code resource. Everything is traceable through your automate server. There's great logs and revision history within our builder system. So it's, while it sounds like it may be more of a difficult situation to manage, at the end of the day, you have two points of entry and that's it. You don't have to have a chef stand up, a automate server, a place to store cookbooks outside of those like your own supermarket, though you can. Um, there's not as many controls to audit at that point. And from a, Where... from a compliance and hardening perspective, that does make life easier. Yeah, uh, that does sound like, um, not having to upload cookbooks and like manage them through chef and do all that stuff um, does sound wonderful. <laughs> um, where, so in that sort of workflow, um, are you having uh, users store their cookbooks like in a, a um, shared code repository like GitHub or something like that? So that's what's cool. You, you actually have multiple options. You can still use on-premises supermarket. Um, Artifactory, even the free tier, has a built-in Chef repo plugin. So you can store them in Artifactory directly. Um, you can, within reason, pull from five or six different repository types without being tied to Chef server directly. Um, I have a customer that's using a mix of Artifactory and on-prem supermarket to manage all of it and some of it internal to the Habitat package. So it's it gives you a little bit more options. Um, as far as policy file goes, they're internal to the, to the actual effortless package. If you wanna make a change to the policy file, it's, it's easy to go, I wanna make this change, let's step it to demo. Ooh, then, so it, it provides like a separation between the file that you're using to manage what gets enforced and like the actual cookbooks that are enforcing it. Correct, because from that point, your policy file, if you wanted to push it through the code pipeline, Builder uses channels just like any SDLC pipeline. You're gonna have dev, test, model, non-prod, prod. You can push your first revision to test. 
if you like it, you push a button or you hit a pipeline and say, let's go ahead and promote this to the next channel. And from then on, everything is SDLC. That's awesome. Um, I, I want to go to Subro as well and ask him the same question, but really quickly, have you, um, have you had a chance to see the shuttle ops, uh, um, like product launch that happened kind of during right before chef comp? No, actually I was, I was still at, uh, our large customer that we did the 17,000 effortless deployment to during that time. And Whoa. that was, that was lockdown week for me. So I didn't, I didn't, I still haven't had a chance. This is the first I've heard of it. Oh, um, it's, uh, it's like a pipeline workflow tool that incorporates habitat packages and builder and all that kind of stuff to like, um, essentially create an end to end, like, to deployment process and stuff for um, for the packages that you are trying to create, which is typically a server or some sort of um, machine or virtual machine like that. Okay, okay. cool. Um, well, I will follow up afterwards then and share you uh, share a conversation about shuttle ops because I think you would. Um, I think you would enjoy or like. I think you would really appreciate the ease and um, like simplicity that it, it provides. So um, cool. Well, Subro, um, what, uh, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out um, as a chef user? Um, like, uh, I liked that Jeff kind of answered, if you're just learning chef or like you're really new to chef, what should you do learning wise? Um, but also uh, what, what like guidance would you give someone as they're trying to implement chef for the first time within their organization? Right. <clears throat> so what I would say is um, what we try to do with chef and with uh, Puppet and with Salt and with all these tools, similar tools uh, and shuttle ops, and we, we can go on. All we are trying to do is simplify uh, our infrastructure into self-sufficient pods, which has very good input and very good output. There's a well-defined input or hopefully a well-defined input. And at least there is a well-defined output, okay? At any point of time, if your infrastructure is returning undefined at any point of time, then that doesn't work. That is something you cannot automate. Computers are binary. You answer in a yes or a no, in a zero or a one. Uh, if you can break down your process where the, the incoming is like, think of it like a tree, right? So you have a node and one input is coming in and the output can be determined into yes and no, if you can do that that can be implemented nicely in code. So when you are very new to Chef, when you're just starting off, my first uh, suggestion is even before you decide on Chef or how you want to implement it, Chef server, effortless, automate, before anything, try to find out that is your infrastructure explainable in binary? If you can, then great. If you cannot, then you need to go figure that out first. Okay, once that is done, if you're really new to Chef, I would say go uh, through each and every module of Learn Chef Rally. Uh, it is really nice. We recently pushed out another major update to Learn Chef Rally. So we essentially overhauled everything. So some of the modules are still missing there the last time I checked, uh, but we are quickly catching up on that one. So go learn the Learn Chef Rally. And while effortless is great, um, and Jeff is going to hate me for this, but where's the documentation, man? We are, we are still, uh, effortless documentation is still not as strong as uh, the traditional Chef Infra documentation. That being said, Je I know Jeff is actively working on it. That's why I kind of pulled his chain a little bit that where's the documentation is being written. And uh, they are coming up with very nice documentation. However, I think that at the end of the day, the services that we try to provide we are providing a website, we are providing a database, whatever we provide, they are still not containerable, like end-to-end. -end. If every if it is a microservice, yes, absolutely, effortless is the way to go. For non-microservices, effortless can be done, but I feel as a beginner, 
it is easier to consider the service as a whole service rather than a cluster of microservices. Okay, so my suggestion is first step, you have to build everything around your source control repository. Like if you don't have one, then forget Chef, forget everything, go install a source control repository first. GitHub is a great example. Uh, GitLab provides on, there are on-prem and hosted solutions available, but have a source control repository. Git is really popular and really uh, powerful. There are lots of tools that integrates with Git, but there are other source controls as well, like Mercurial, which works very nicely. I mean, I'm a big fan of Mercurial, which is very similar to Git, but build your source control repository. And the next step you should do is use a pipeline software everything gets triggered from a pipeline. And I did not say Jenkins, I said pipeline, because it doesn't matter. Today you have Jenkins, tomorrow you'll have Concourse, the day after tomorrow you'll have Travis, something else. But the core concept, what is a pipeline? A pipeline is a bunch of processes that are being run in a particular order, one after the other. And the output of one is being fed into the input of the second, the one down the line. Everything builds around a pipeline, Chef specific answer, um, infrastructure for now is very well tested. Chef Infra, traditional Chef Infra uh, is well tested, mm -hmm. has been around for quite some time. Uh, the documentation is great. And if something goes wrong, uh, there is a lot of people I can ask for Habitat plus effortless. We used to call that Habi Chef because it's Habitat Managed Chef. Um, I joke with uh, Jeff. Jeff is a big proponent of uh, effortless. I say that, hey, effortless. No, it's not effortless. There is a lot of effort. It's not <laughs> even effortless. It's effort a lot, but they call it effortless. But, I, uh, I have to interrupt you really quick because you have so, like, when you were talk talking about a pipeline tool yeah. and that being, like, super pivotal, um, the chat, like, lit up. Everybody agrees, like, um, having a pipeline, it doesn't matter if it's Jenkins or AD Azure DevOps or Circle CI or sh yeah, any of those, but getting yes. that pipeline um, or that, that pipeline management is so key to this. Um, and I, I like, until I came to Chef, I kind of didn't really know what source control was. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be honest, when I started, I was like, oh yeah, I can drink this Kool-Aid. Like, yeah, it's cool. Um, and as like the, <laughs> the longer I've been at Chef, the more I realize, like, no, having source control is such a game changer for even if you're just doing like bash scripts or something in your, you know, in your environments. So. Anyway, um, I just wanted to interrupt and and talk about pipelines um, for for a moment. And yeah, just yes. said pipeline is life. <laughs> yes, and the pipeline is uh, people like to talk. See, Jenkins has been around more than the time I have been around in software engineering. Okay, mm -hmm. so Jenkins is a very old software. It used to be called Hudson. Uh, it renamed to Jenkins. Uh, I am particularly uh, familiar and uh, let's say I have a lot of uh, fluency and currency in Jenkins. Mm -hmm. uh, I am, so Jenkins is my pipeline of choice, but it doesn't matter. It's the idea of building everything in a predictable way and one after the other. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible that you're, can you have an exhaustive list of all outputs? In other words, if I ask you a question, hey, Jody, what color of T-shirt are you wearing today? If I can, no, if I can think a program asking that question. Now, if the, you have an exhaustive list of colors, then that's great, but it's not mm -hmm. possible in most of the cases. So when you were writing your automation, you were writing your software, you could only come up with four colors, okay? Because for some reason, you just couldn't remember more than four colors. <laughs> And it, it responds with a color that is not one of those four. That is where you need the human. As long as it's responding with the four colors that you could think of, you really don't need a human. It is, we cannot argue the fact that a computer is actually much better than humans at doing repetitive tasks. If it is a task that is repetitive, a computer is going to beat a human every single time. The trouble starts when you give it stuff where you need a decision which is non-binary.
mm. if you can uh, if you can identify the non-binary portions of your infrastructure and write proper you know ring the bell if this happens uh, clause in your pipeline or essentially your, your infrastructure as a code you can go devops very quickly you don't have to sort out the whole problem end to end before you say okay now i'm ready to write the code that is not how it works yeah i yeah i like <laughs> all of what you said especially like being able to, um like if the output is something that you haven't been able to codify, you need a human. There's so many times in these conversations where people freak out about automation just to begin with, because well, wait a minute, that means I'm automating my own job or I, like you're automating the tasks that um, you spend time doing all day. And so people think that that translates as I'm automating myself out of a job. And that totally. is not the that case is so at true. all. That is so true. I've come across that so many times. Every and, company. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Every company. I and you're not, that. what you're doing is freeing yourself up to be able to focus on much cooler stuff in the end like yeah yep <laughs> uh, there <laughs> is so a, common though i'm a big fan of xkcd and uh the xkcd cartoons and there's a cartoon uh i i actually used to have a big printout i took it out uh, i took it down it was framed and it was hanging at my back it says good good sysadmins are lazy and that is the proof that they are good sysadmins <laughs> you have a sysadmin that is always fighting fires you know, like there's a fire, go uh, put it out. There's another fire, go put it out. Is there a fire? Should I be ready with my fire extinguisher? If that is the sysadmin uh, you are dealing with, then probably you are fixing it wrong. So. Yeah, I mean, in every company I've worked for, we've had that battle. And manpower studies alone show that not only do they save money by automating and teaching their people to fish, they can pass that money down and pay people better because they're not wasting time on the low hanging fruit. And that's, I mean, that's goal number one for everybody that does what we do is to, how can I sit at work all day and just not do much, <laughs> right? Just let me write documentation. Let me find another project that'll improve work. Let, let's not have to worry about how we're gonna change these users' files or passwords or remediate this one setting on 25,000 servers without having to do it hands-on and write a crappy script. like. Who wants to do that? It's terrible. Uh, it's that culture shift. Yep. I, I was just going to say, who wants to do that? It's those like, <laughs> those people in the basement. <laughs> the ones that are like clinging to their red stapler and... <laughs> but, uh, uh, but here is something I would like to add. Um, I'm a pilot, I mentioned earlier, right? And these days, airplanes have become, even small airplanes, GAs, like general aviation aircraft, they have become capable enough to not quite land or take themselves off the ground, but they can fly themselves, okay? And autopilot is used all the time, but it is still important to know how to fly by hand because if your autopilot goes away, you know, your autopilot will say, I'm done, at the most, at the worst moment. And if you don't know how to fly by hand, like raw stick and rudder skills, you will crash. It's yeah. just, just like that. So yes, you are automating everything, but understand how the automation is put together. And this is where my primary difference comes with Jeff. Like if you are using effortless patterns, everything is like a self-sufficient blob, mm -hmm. which somehow works when dropped into place, okay? Like Habitat takes care of everything. If you do not quite understand how the service is put together, then if something breaks at some point of time, your plane is unpliable because you have no <laughs> stick and rudder skills. Mm. Not, not would, necessarily. Yeah. I don't I would argue you still need to um you still need to know how the habitat packages are like you don't necessarily need to know how the habitat portion of things is going. You still need to know the chef infra side of things, though. Yes, that so is what still... I was trying to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. And, and uh, 
Oh, sorry. Alan um, made a really good analogy in the chat. Uh, there are no elevator operators anymore, but there's also more money in elevator repair. Um, and you get to learn a lot more skills and you learn more about the elevator than you would standing inside it and operating it. Um, and that, like, I think that goes back to what you were saying, Sue Bro. Like, uh, if, if you automate a process but don't know how to fix it in the end or don't know what what went into automating it in the first place what it is actually automating then when it starts to break you're like what i don't know like i don't have control of that thing it's it's doing its own thing so yeah that this is another thing i have uh, i have come across at multiple customers they ask okay you make a pipeline it's uh, kind of self-aware it watches your source control automatically builds things, promotes things, uh, you know, things end up in the production without any human intervention, zero touch essentially. But do you have a, like a big red switch? Because if, if somehow my pipeline gets poisoned, then I need to stop it. Okay. And that is, that is something I've come across multiple times. And that is where your, your raw stick and rudder skills come into play. Like, if your automation breaks or you're not able to enable it for some reason, your services should still be deployable. Now, with non-effortless, I feel, and again, I'm not as proficient in effortless as Jeff is, so it is a part of my not knowing the whole infrastructure. Um, but I feel that with traditional Chef Infra, you are still pretty close to the metal that you can still make it work if your if your autopilot gives up on you, okay. But uh, with effortless, it's a little bit farther away. Uh, like if your builder breaks, okay, for some reason, have it at supervising uh, supervisor's core dumping, okay. How do you still keep your service working? Because your website is what, or your web app, or your app is essentially what brings money in your bank account. Habitat does not. Okay, so even if Habitat is broken and your app is still servicing fine, that is a much preferable solution than both of them breaking at the same time. Mm -hmm. Again, that being said, I do not know Habitat well enough to make an authoritative comment on it. That's just my take on the whole matter. Okay, so here, here's where the I think the common misconception has been internally and externally. Um, Habitat applications are absolutely separate from effortless. All effortless is, and 99% 90, of the failures you see is the same as with Chef Client. The cookbook's bad. The recipe's broken. Um, something in your attributes is wrong. If effortless breaks, it is the same type of breakage you would see in traditional Chef Client. Correct. The but, difference is, yes, go ahead. You can pivot way more quickly because you can change the code in one spot and get it in the pipeline and out directly to the servers without having to change a run list or anything. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, and that's done because we wanted to separate the chef client from crashing with any application on the system. So if chef breaks, chef breaks, if habitat breaks, habitat breaks, you can still remediate, you can still be compliant, or you can still fix your habitat app and push it out immediately. I do not know enough about it. That's what I said. I do not know the infrastructure right. I, enough I, I, to have an authoritative that. comment on that. I'm just throwing the information. Out no, there. absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate it, man. The the thing I would say is, uh, what is your experience, Jeff, on finding people that are doing effortless but not habitizing their app? Actually, um, I have had more effortless than app. Uh, we okay. actually have some fairly large customers using app. Like uh, the customer I was at last time with their 17,000 is actually smaller. No, I'm scale. asking about people who are doing effortless, but not habitizing apps. Re exactly. Okay. That's what I'm saying. They're, they're using just the effortless piece as a I, stepping okay. stone to get to the apps. Because if you can get the chef client to run that way and understand the simpl simplified version of that kind of build, Moving on to the apps and knowing how to use the core plans is part of doing effortless. So when you go to build a Tomcat server or an Apache stack, it's it's kind of like a, not even really a shift. I taught myself habits that 
by taking our national parks demo and making it Windows. It's a Java app that needs all kinds of crazy non-Windows native things. And just going through the examples and seeing the plan files and understanding how they work is not as simple as just writing a cookbook and compiling the chef client and hitting go. But so yes, and that is the point. When you someone is so here's the thing. I tried to teach my uh, my wife how to drive my car. Okay, I drive a car which is a is a stick shift. She constantly dumps the clutch. Okay, she is trying to learn how to drive a car. She has to watch for other cars. You know, she has to watch for a dog, watch for a child, watch for random things, and also watch for the clutch. Okay, with chef, I feel you are putting an automatic transmission. Once you get this thing out. It is one less thing you have to learn because with effortless, you have to learn chef mm -hmm. and habitat. With traditional chef infra, you just learn chef infra. Absolutely go effortless. That's the next step. But mm -hmm. don't put it right on the first one. That is that is my take on it. But again, I am not enough good in effortless to have a, uh, you know, have a very strong opinion on that. I think what I've liked about using um, effortless for like tutorials and training uh, environments and stuff is um, it it actually is it, like super to your point and in my opinion it actually takes away that step um, and makes it a lot easier to just jump straight into what is the the like result that I want um, let me put that in a recipe really quick package it with, uh, with habitat, um, and then like use the, the habitat config hooks to manage the client and like the way that, that, um, that cookbook runs. Now I've been using it locally. Um, and so I haven't, um, I haven't scaled it out to 17,000 <laughs> servers. Um, but I am interested, Jeff, um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Like I've, I've definitely worked with it where, um, where on the system, I'm logged into a system um, and download Habitat, create the package on that system and then kick it off from there. Can you talk a little bit about like uh, the methodology around scaling that um, or like running Habitat, um, or sorry, not Habitat, running effortless packages on your system in a more automated fashion because what i described is very manual process still even though you're you're automating certain bits of it oh i think you might be muted i'm, I'm muted <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's actually how we started um started originally where we were uh, we were hand deploying to 20 year machines or so for testing, getting the packages right, making sure everything was automated. Uh, we have a cookbook, a community cookbook for Habitat. I took it over in February and I figured out that it would pretty much do everything for us. I built it to where we could use Chef Client 12 to run the Habitat cookbook that would then install Habitat. From there, you can write a wrapper that will load your effortless servers, load your habitat applications, and manage your channels and everything directly from a cookbook. So you essentially just adding a, add, adding a cookbook to your policy file that says, hey, here's my effortless audit, here's my effortless remediation, here's any hab package I want to load or just, just get rid of or whatever, and push it, and you're done. Um, once we figured that out, we were able to go from 100 machines to 6,000 machines in two nights just by running another cookbook in the list. Gee, it's, it, it's, it's really that straightforward. Like, I get the having to learn HAB, but like you said earlier, I think it actually kind of, I don't want to say a disservice, but it takes 30 to 45% of what you have to learn completely out of the equation because you no longer have to know knife. You no longer have to understand how to configure your knife.rb file at all, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it's essentially building a cookbook, having a plan file, and hitting have package built. That's it. It's 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 like an extra ten lines of code outside of your cookbooks. I hitting think I'm. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, getting that to scale, we didn't even need rings since every system have its own has its own supervisor. It checks into automate and shows you the client runs. It checks into A2 and shows you your, your compliance. You don't have to make it complicated. It, at the end of the day, looks just like traditional minus a server. Hmm. That's cool. I think that um, that kind of reflects also how you would deploy Chef Infra server now if you were going to go that pattern. Um, now, uh, like I, <laughs> I spent like three or four episodes of this this uh, stream trying to um, figure out how to deploy a Terraform package that did this, but um, the Chef Automate package now gives you the ability to deploy Chef Infra server as a service within that server, um, which, and all of that is managed, like all of that is um, packaged and deployed and managed using Habitat on the sort of, on the, under the um, hood there. So um, I, I think that's very similar to what you were talking about, Jeff, but just on a more like, um, like the, you're not gonna have 17,000 automate servers or infra servers in your environment. So you wouldn't need it, but <laughs> yeah. but it does make deploying Chef infra server a lot easier. Um, have either of you used that uh, capability as you're um, deploying Chef infra in, um, in your uh, customer engagements, the like the new ability to just uh, deploy Chef infra as a service? I have not. I have only been effortless for about the entire 12 of 14 months that I've been here. Oh, wow. Were you using effortless before you came to Chef? Nope. Oh, cool. Um, Subro, have you been able to look into that? No, I have not. Sorry. Oh, no, don't be. <laughs> I think it came out like relatively recently within the last year for sure. Um, or... I should say uh, they released it, like they made an announcement about it within the last year. I think it's been in there for a, a, a while based on um, how we had to implement OpsWorks for Chef Automate on AWS. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's really cool. And um, like I say this a lot on this um, channel, but um, it proves that we're paying down a lot of technical debt. Um, and uh, as we document it more so that Supro approves more uh, readily of it, um, we're, we're getting these processes down that are um, a lot more efficient and a lot um, easier for new users to get started with. Um, Cool. Well, we, t we talked a lot about Chef Infra um, and maybe a little bit about Chef Habitat, but has either of you worked at all with um, Chef Inspec and um, getting tests implemented? I have. Uh, Jeff, oh, nice. I think you also did, right? I mean, that's, that's number one in the engagement. Let's write your test before we write your remediation. <laughs> right. Uh, recently, I have been working with a really big bank. Uh, I can't tell you the name, sorry. But uh, uh, I have been working with a really big bank, which required a lot of custom inspec. Um, and uh, yeah, that is a very core part of... Um, see, here's the thing. Uh, if you are automating your, your uh, setup and you are building on a pipeline, your tests are your eyes. If you don't have tests, you're flying blind and everyone knows what happens when you fly blind, okay? So that is the core requirement. You should have good tests. If some, and again, this goes to the same thing I mentioned earlier. Can you have an exhaustive list of every single bug that will have ever happened caught in your test? No, that's not possible. Okay, that's a mammal task, but at least fail gracefully. If you get, instead of looking for the the failures, look for the successes in your tests. So if you don't find a success, that's implicitly a failure. That might still be a success, which means the tests have to be fixed. So again, uh, testing is never like, oh, I've written that, forget it. That, that never happens that way. Test is always ongoing. You write a test, you write the code to make the test pass. 
you still end up with a bug that the test didn't catch, which means you have to go fix the test now. So, and uh, with Chef Inspect, I have uh, written, I have helped my client not just write tests as a part of the cookbook, but also as a pipeline test where you are doing integration testing with, with your product. So you have a, to take an example, a very simple web application that gives a page that has two text fields. You enter two numbers, hit submit button, it adds the numbers for you. Very simple web application, right? Uh, when you are deploying out the infrastructure, you are interested in is Apache or Nginx running on port 80? Is the SSL certificate correct? Is my web application, does it require Java? Is Java running? Is the heap size correct? All these stuff is infrastructural details. And you bother about those tests while you write the cookbook. You write appropriate tests to catch those cases. My heap size is not 256M. Okay, complain. That's a valid test. That is for the infrastructure. But do those really matter when you are looking at the customer end? If you put three and two in that web application and get 32, then you have a problem. Okay, and your infrastructure is not going to catch that. You are going to write pipeline tests, which is going to feed pre-calculated results to your app and see what you get back. Does that match? That can be done with Inspect, and that is exactly what I did for my customer. So Inspect tests Ooh. are not just uh, living with your cookbook, but it is also living outside your cookbooks. Yeah. The current customer I'm working with, uh, I'm actually implementing something very similar where the pipeline tests are living in a completely separate repository and they are being integrated into the pipeline on the fly based on which, so the entire pipeline is dynamic, it's built on the fly. There is no pipeline job sitting inside Jenkins, uh, but uh, the pipeline is built dynamically and the tests are picked dynamically. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. I don't think it is uh, good enough that I'm comfortable signing it off uh but uh yeah well that, we know goal. it's gonna need a lot of documentation and yes. before you sign off on it yeah. <laughs> cool um well okay i want to be cognizant of time because i know supro i think you had to leave at 50 after i can stick around till the top of the hour so i can be here till 12 o'clock Okay, awesome. Um, well, then I want to ask. Um, I, I came to this to this whole automation world um, from the systems administrator side. Definitely operations. Definitely configuration management side of things. Um, and so uh, when I heard about Inspec, I, I was super excited about it, and I totally understand the value of being able to, um, like you're saying, define. Um, define the expectations of the end result um, and make sure that throughout the whole pipeline and throughout the whole process, it still matches your expectations. Um, and that doesn't just like give you security in the end. Um, it also helps you identify a lot easier where stuff is actually breaking because now since it's in the whole pipeline the whole process um, if it breaks over here then then now you can figure out where in the test or whatever stage this is at the beginning um, whatever um, stage that is you can focus on that instead of getting it out into production um, yeah. and finding out like two two weeks or two years sometimes into it that um, there's like some errant line of code that uh, has caused like I don't know if you're doing transactions, it's caused a cent per transaction or maybe 1% of a cent per transaction in error. But over two years time, if you're doing millions of transactions per day, that's gonna end up costing you a lot of money. Um, and being able to have that, that like testing stuff in the beginning, I totally, definitely 100% see the value of that. Um, can you explain like, can you give advice to someone who's from the config management side of the world um, on how to like really get started with inspect, not just using profiles, because that is like easy as pie, right? Um, I mean, like, how do I, how do I get started 
um, learning the language well enough to to be able to write my own like really cool tests like you like you're both doing. So, uh, do you want me to answer, or do you want Jeff to take that question? <laughs> Either one. Whoever has the most burning desire to answer. <laughs> How are you so with I, config management, Subro? Sorry, say that again. You you wanted uh, me to take it. I said, how are you with config management? You, you've been on that side of the house a while. Yes, uh, a little. I mean, go for it then. Uh, we can we can go back and forth if you want. Uh, sure. So, someone who is uh, starting off, and this is not just about inspect tests. This is about the mentality. DevOps is a mentality. Uh, it is something that you have to. It's like a language. You don't speak. You can you can pick up a dictionary and start reading it. It will not make any sense. Okay, unless you form sentences, it will not make any sense. So build, have the attitude of catching something as left of the pipeline as possible. So as close to writing the code as possible, if you can catch it quickly, it's easier to fix because it is like a lot of people um, have learned how to code in C, right? If you miss a semicolon on one of your first lines of C code, you will see it complains like, 20,000 errors, okay? Those are all cascading errors. These cascading efforts will, errors will go away if you catch it to the left of the pipeline. As early as possible, catch it. And testing is, a, is kind of like an art, okay? When you're talking of config management, what does a typical config management look like? Is that particular kernel module loaded, okay? Is that file, is that particular line present in the conf file? That is config management. You can absolutely write a test that says that open httpd.conf and look for this line, write a regular expression that will match it, or open sshd.conf, look for protocol too. That is, that is fine. And you can write that test. But is it, is, is it possible that in our SSH example, you're actually opening up, opening up a connection to the server and try to run protocol one? If it closes your connection, that's a successful test. Here is what you have tested. You have tested the service. You have tested whether you have the correct line in the config file. You have tested your network. You have tested your file descriptors. So you have to stack up tests appropriately. Again, if you do that, you're moving it to the right. So you have to strike a balance. There is no absolute answer to that question. Uh, I would say break up your work into manageable chunks, chunks mm -hmm. that you are comfortable to manage and write a test to guard that chunk. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Like start small and um, work your way up sort of. Yes, yes. Yeah, all right, cool. Jeff, do you have any um, any advice as well? Yeah, I, it's not dissimilar from, from what Zebra has to say. Um, a lot of times I see a lot of people dipping their, their, their toes in the pond doing basic OS configuration tests. Um, did my golden image build with these settings? Is this PowerShell running this in the way I expect it to? When my build is complete, is this installed? Is this installed? Is it the right version? Are these registry keys present? Uh, that's a great way to learn. I also think it would be a good idea to maybe get into your, get into your editor, take a PowerShell script or some kind of script that you're familiar with, use some of our script resources and inspect that will let you just run that script and see what the output looks like figure out how to scrape that code to get exactly what you want from that test or um, inspect as well as chef client and i don't know if a lot of people use it have built-in shells so you can actually open an inspect shell and write inspect code in there just to test it purely you don't have to do it in a file and test it against machines which is a great way to teach yourself. That's how I learned how to do a lot of the more complex tests I've found. Cool, yeah. So when you're talking about opening the inspect shell, basically like it's running the test against whatever system you're running locally? Actually, it's just testing to see that the logic of your code is correct. Oh, okay, okay. I got, sorry, duh. <laughs> um, but what what you're saying is exactly something else that you could you, that you would do um i will sit there trying to figure out how to get powershell to show me a list of all domain users with this pretext and see if i can scrape that into something that an ugly powershell table that inspect hates 
which is a huge problem. A lot of people wanting to do windows, there's not a lot of options when it comes to PowerShell type things that we don't have resources for. So you have to take the time to break it down to a true false rather than a broken PowerShell like exit one <laughs> vomit of code, like the big red text that you can't scrape, uh, which happens quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so I take it you're, uh, you're a Windows person, more of a... Actually, uh, Jeff I is am... A, Jeff is an all-rounder. I am, yeah, I'm extremely efficient in Mac, Linux, and Windows. I've done all three for most of my career. Nice. And I and I can barely spell Windows. <laughs> no, I... True story. I the last Windows I was able to install successfully in one shot was Windows XP. After oh, then on, I have always had to scratch it. Oh no, I screwed up the partition. No, I screwed up the package. I screwed up this. I screwed up that. So... Oh my gosh. Um, I just, <laughs> I just. Uh had a conversation with my grandpa this weekend um, where he was talking about how uh, for some reason his doctor's office, they, they sent him an app that they wanted him to use to have like a teledoc appointment. Um, and for some reason his operating system couldn't handle it. He's not sure why, because he's on Windows Vista. <laughs> I was like, oh, grandpa. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, he also didn't realize that there were like three webcams on his laptop and he was like, I don't have any webcams, so I couldn't do it anyway. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I hope you have never called in for like computer support and allowed them to take control <laughs> of your laptop for anything. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, well, we're about three minutes away from the top of the hour, and I know both of you are incredibly busy right now actually helping um, customers of ours, so I want to be cognizant of your time, um, and I, it wouldn't be a Chef Live episode if I didn't end it um, expelling a bunch of gratitude um, for both of you. Um, I, I um, was telling Garth before you both joined, Garth is our executive producer, I was telling him about um, the ProServe team um, and just how much you all do um, and the level of um, knowledge and expertise um, and flexibility really um, that is required to do the job of a prof professional services um, engineer is just uh, um, huge. Uh, Will is, um, Will Fisher agrees in the chat. Um, uh, so I just want to say really big thank you um, just for doing your jobs and um, and making it easy for customers to implement Chef. But also thank you very much for joining me today and giving me um, some of your valuable time to share uh, your expertise for free with my um, <laughs> with my viewers. Um, so yeah, really big thank you, Subro. Really big thank you, Jeff. Um, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I hope you both don't mind. But I will definitely be inviting you back for more conversations as well. Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Totally. Also, uh, for awesome. everyone watching watching this. Uh, this stream uh, now live later on. Uh, we at Chef <laughs> Professional Services, we don't bite. Uh, we, we really are friendly people. And we want, we have extensive, we have a lot of experience uh, uh, onboarding people who have little knowledge, no knowledge, a lot of knowledge, all kinds of people. So if you are interested, please hit us up and we would see what we can do for you. Awesome. Well, everybody have a wonderful Friday. Um, happy end of June. And uh, hopefully your July, the beginning of your July is amazing. We'll see you um, in a week, 11 a.m. Pacific time on Friday next week. Um, bye, y'all.